Hi. Hello, hello. Hiya. Hello, nice to see you. Hello and welcome to Let's Keep Chatting. I'm Lisa and this is Elric and we're from Five Center for Qualities. Hey, hello, hello. You've seen us before, sure. <laughs> <laughs> and today we are chatting to David from Psychology Action. Hi David, good to have you on your board. <laughs> Great to be here and um, looking forward to having a very formal and useful chat. Yeah, excellent. I got my cuppa. I think you're missing that, but very important. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, cuppa is always good. Absolutely. <laughs> the part is about uh, community groups or organisations from around five, and we chat about what they're doing to help people from different equality groups and how they're dealing with poverty and how they've been coping with the current COVID-19 situation as well. Yeah, so it's 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 a podcast, obviously, but we also record it so that some people can actually see it on, on YouTube and then we can click on uh, CC closed captions and get some subtitles. Not the best one, but it's available as well. Yeah, sounds good. Uh, so let's chat about psychology in action. Uh, David, can you tell us a bit about your role within the group and how, how the organisation has been helping everyone lately? Yes, um, surely so I could try my best. Um, well, basically, I, I'm David McGrath and I'm a capacity building officer and I work with Five Voluntary Action. But in particular, what I'd like to talk about is a particular project that um, I've been doing with a number of um, a group of officers. We've had representation, <coughs> pardon me, not only from Five Voluntary Action, but from Five Council, Five Council's Third Sector Strategy Group, NHS, and all these five. And we developed a project which is entitled Your Story, Your Community. <clears throat> the purpose of the project really is to find out as much as possible from people who live and work in Fife about their experiences of the COVID pandemic. Over the past year, people in Fife have had to save, they've had to face several challenges, you know, which the pandemic's created. Everything from lockdown to furlough, seeing loved ones or just simply going shopping. We believe everyone's has had a story to tell. So Lisa, if we're honest, well, you know, let's be honest, everyone likes to tell stories and every day we tell each other stories. So this is the basis of our Your Story, Your Community. We're asking people to tell us their story, good or bad, about their experiences of the COVID pandemic in Fife. <coughs> it's entirely up to the person who is telling us a story to decide what they want to tell us. Stories that are submitted are done entirely anonymously. We can't identify the individual telling the story. If people so wish, they can submit more than one story. The kinds of stories up to now, Lisa, that people have been telling us about have included things like, what's it like to get a vaccine? People have told us stories about neighbours who helped each other out during lockdown. We've picked up stories about services or charities and community groups who've came to people's aid. We've had stories about how people coped with improving their mental health. People have told us about the challenge of working during lockdown, what it was like travel, social distancing, keeping everyone safe around them. But obviously we've had stories about volunteering and how people rose to the occasion to help others out. And we've even had stories about parents and young people, how they coped with homeschooling. So if people would like to share a story with us, what do they do? It's very quick and easy to tell us your story. It's all done online and mm -hmm. questions only take a few minutes to complete. If you visit our Five Voluntary Action webpage, it's www fva.org there's a banner on the front page entitled your story your community click on the banner and it'll take you directly to the your story your community questions we share that link as well that sounds good that would be super. i mean in the information on how you can access your story community it's also been shared on social media and you'll find us a, a QR code which if you scan it by your phone will take you directly to the questions we realise not everyone will have access to computers and phones and that. But if this is the case, why not ask a friend or a relative to access your story, your community for you? It's very easy for them to do this by using a smartphone. Can I ask a quick question, David? Please ask any questions at any time, please. Just, like some people might not might want to like want to be part of this, right? Sure. But could they like send post it into you as well? Um, or would you prefer it online? 
I would be preferable online because the reason being is if somebody posts it into us, we could identify them. And we're very, very passionate about not identifying people here. We want people to be honest and to not feel that they could be identified individually. Right, so okay. we would prefer it to be done online. In an ideal world, we would have people out there talking to people in the community, but because of the COVID and social distancing, this is extremely difficult to do. Mm. You know? But I mean, probably people will ask us as well, what, what do we do with these stories we capture then? So there's probably three points I would raise here. I think first of all, the stories will help us understand better how communities have worked together or not during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Um, it'll also help us understand where services have responded well or not. There's been a lot of services out there working in our communities in Fife, and we need to find out what's went well and what hasn't. But I think perhaps more importantly for me, stories will help communities contribute to future plans and priorities which will affect everyone's lives in Fife. So I'm hoping that these stories will help Fife move forward. And probably what's been one of the most difficult and challenging situations many of us have faced probably in our lifetimes. The Your Story, Your Community, we're going to run it until the end of April. Um, I would naturally ask everyone to tell us your story as soon as possible. The more stories we collect, the richer the information becomes, the more we can find out. I thought maybe just to finish sort of this bit just now, I would just sort of um, give you a wee sample story that we've received from someone who completed a story. So my group met on a weekly basis and worked closely to coordinate our response. It was great to work with a group who worked hard, cared, and we're willing to do anything to help the local community and those in need. That's just a typical example of a story that we picked up very randomly. So it's kind of open to anyone, really. It's not as if you have to have an amazing, like you save the world and, and you've got superpowers or something like that. No, it could be anyone who's, who's had an experience. We can just basically just log in and, and share it with you. And, uh, Absolutely. Right. I mean, okay. Don't think um, your story is unimportant or not relevant or, as you say, you have to be a high flyer. We want everybody who's got a story to respond to tell us. We want all areas of life to tell us. We want everybody, no matter what people's background is or, or, or what they want to tell us, we want you to tell us your story so we understand what's been happening in Fife over the last year. Okay. Yeah. I think... Um, with COVID, because of COVID-19, you know, since March last year, there's been many organisations that could probably help take part in this. Mm -hmm. because, because at the beginning, you know, we have spoken to some that have been created just because of what has been going on, you know, and some of them are still working. So, you know, they could probably get their story across to help you to, for part of your uh, project. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, Lisa. Um, what we're all saying to people as well, we've been talking to lots of organisations about spreading the word about your your story, your community. Um, very often, some of the workers don't think about filling in a questionnaire themselves because they don't realise, well, it's, it's aimed at, is it for me or is it for the groups I engage with? We're saying, mm -hmm. well, it's for everybody. Please. I like that. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely for everybody. Um, so, obviously, if we get a lot of different backgrounds, we get a lot of different stories. The most important thing we want to do is learn from this. We want to make sure that whatever happens in Fife moving forward is informed by the learning that communities tell us when we engage with them. So that's a crucial bit for me. Yeah. Okay. So, so what, what what kind of, um, well, it depends on the stories, but what, what kind of outlets or where, where do where do you think the, the storytelling you know, would go next after this, after April? It's April, that's... Yes, <clears throat> that's a fair question. Um, basically, we want to, our first priority is capture as many stories as possible. Um, we are using, um, it's the first time it's ever been used in Fife. It's actually a programme called SenseMaker. It's well, world renowned. If you actually go and look, look up Google or YouTube, you'll find lots of different places in the world that has used SenseMaker. And what SenseMaker does very simply is, very objectively, it is able to analyse all the information that comes in for us and actually draw conclusions from that. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if I was to say to, to people, did you have a positive or a negative experience as a result of COVID? I could tell you at the end of it, SenseMaker could tell me exactly how many people told me a positive or a negative story. They could, it not only could do that, 
but it could actually tell me the reasons why that story is positive or negative. So it's very groundbreaking. The programme has been used very successfully in other parts of the UK. But this is a first, as far as I'm aware, for Fife that we've actually mm -hmm. used this. Um, so as I say, we're all used to doing questionnaires and survey monkeys. Very often, as a user, can seem very leading. They can seem like they're asking you questions that, that you, as, um, you think people already know the answer to. Mm -hmm. This is an opportunity where it's a blank canvas and people can just tell us their story, whatever they feel they want to tell us. And we'll do the rest to analyse that story and work out trends from it. So that's really what SenseMaker is all about. And that's what we will do come April is start mm -hmm. to analyse that information and represent it. I'm hoping somewhere down the line in the future that we can make this information more accessible to the public. So, for example, if um, I'll give you an example, let's say the Scottish Government were doing a, a study into home learning and people's experiences of what was home learning like for you, what was homeschooling like, what was your internet connection like. If we've got stories that people have told us, we would be able to share that. We'd be able to say to the Scottish Government, there you go, there's lots of stories about people's experiences of home learning and what they mm -hmm. thought good or bad about it. So mm -hmm. imagine if lots of people came back and said, oh, it was great, but my broadband was terrible. And surely there would be a focus on saying, we need to look at that moving forward. We need to do that because a lot of people came back and told us it wasn't any good. Now, I stress, mm -hmm. that's just an example. That's hypothetical. But mm -hmm. hopefully it lets you see how the information we capture, we can analyse and then represent that for the most important forum, how five moves forward with this. See the results. Is it just based on, like, what people are sending into you or can you get results from other departments that or teams that might be able to help you because for me i have been filling in all the homeschooling uh, questionnaires that have been coming out from the education department to, mm -hmm. to the parents mm -hmm. you know so things like that would you use some of their information as well to see how it would benefit uh, fair question, Lisa. I think um, I may be cautious about it because I don't want to lead. It's very mm -hmm. easy to tell a story by pulling information that suits your story together and then representing that. So to be honest with you, I think the focus of this is all about people's stories. They want to feel if they've told a story and it draws a conclusion, it's only come from them. It's only come from the communities. It's not mm -hmm. being led by departments or services or agencies who have a vested interest in what these stories are going to tell you. So to me, it's got to be as independent as possible. I think that's what I would say. Mm -hmm. yeah. but, but have you been doing, I mean, it's, it's, it's one of, it's really difficult, obviously, to, to connect to certain groups because we know, you yes. know, internet and <coughs> Mm -hmm. and, and and obviously we have a center for equality. So we're always all interested about the groups that technically have had uh, have uh, additional barriers to actually participate in. Might, might it be, does it have to be surveys? It could be anything in everyday sure. life. So, uh, how does it work? D have you been doing work specific with specific groups about it, or uh, is there support for for groups that might have barriers in using it to actually yeah. access it in some way? Or I think you, I think you are um, highlighting a very real challenge that we've got with that. Mm -hmm. um, you're quite right under qualities of people need to access this. Is it fair if it's only done by computer? Is it fair if people maybe have visual or, you know, or yeah, that's what I, was thinking. Oh, yeah. I will be honest to say it's, it's difficult. And what I've tried to do is I've tried to visit various forums to spread the word. In other words, mm -hmm. we're trying to connect with agencies out there that are operating in Fife to raise awareness of SenseMaker and then and, and our, your story, your community. But in particular, to sit and talk down with their users and their clients and say, okay, can we help you tell a story here? You know, mm -hmm. so in other words, we, we acknowledge we can't do everything. And being honest, the pandemic has brought a few challenges regarding that because, mm -hmm. for example, um, one of the things we could have did that we couldn't do because of the pandemic is we wanted to use telephones where a volunteer could sit with someone and do the questionnaire with them. But that's mm -hmm. a challenge if you've got to socially distance and you can sit with the person. Now, at a distance, tell me your story at a distance. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So um, that's why I'm trying to say to people, you know, very nicely, if you can access a smartphone and you want to sit with somebody and you understand they've maybe got a hearing impairment or 
maybe a visual thing, perhaps you can engage with that person and help them tell their story. Mm -hmm. um, SenseMaker is looking at recording. In other words, it's looking at it's up recording, doing an audio record of an interview. But we're just not quite there yet. Now, that may evolve over the next few weeks as the project continues. Um, but that issue has been raised and we're very sensitive and realistic about that, that we want to try and get as many people as possible. And the last thing we want is there to be barriers that prevent people from participating in this. But equally, we are depending on other services, community groups, agencies, services helping us out here because they are probably the people that are engaging with the most vulnerable, the most at a distance from this exercise. So mm -hmm. we really need the help of services and agencies with this as well. Yeah, it's definitely one thing that uh, COVID has, has shown. There's, there's an awful lot of out of a expected communication loop as well. That's, that's something yes. that we have picked up on. It's, sure. I, I mean, I don't know, but Lisa's, Lisa's boat usually drops off somewhere around now, so I'm just, I'm just finding that up now. I don't blame Lisa for dropping off. <laughs> <laughs> that's one for I don't know how many, I don't know times with internet connection that I've sort of dropped out of conversations and then popped back in. <laughs> It's, 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 I'm to it. yeah, yeah. it's around the 20 minute mark so I, i've seen the pattern so i'm just saying that's what it is around now but but it's not just broadband i'm good today it, <laughs> you're gonna jinx it yeah, i'm just ready for a new virtuality that's actually that, that, that talks to what i want to talk about so that, what 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 what's put in place to deal with these uh barriers and and people that actually they, they, they might want to tell a story, but actually uh, th there's a few things. There's like being recognized that you've, your story wants to be heard. That's it. That's that's a start. And then being able to actually go out there and, and do it. So that's really good. So, Thanks. so we, can, we can do it through, through, their, through organizations that they're working with, maybe specific to the community or the local area or something like that. Yeah. So, yeah. So question, because I'm, I'm curious, how are, you, how are you coping with COVID and all that? Um, <laughs> Yourself, good, your team. And... Um, very good question. I think, um, to be very honest, one of the things that we have done mainly last year, we're still doing it this year, is Five Voluntary Action was doing our Help Enhance system. Mm -hmm. That was basically where anyone in Fife who was having difficulties could contact us and we would do our best to sort of help. So mainly if people were struggling to do shopping, um, access food. Sometimes people have difficulty with white goods. They might have difficulty picking up prescriptions. Then we um, we basically did our best to help with that. So last year, I'll describe the daytime job went out the window and we ended up doing a lot of manual phoning people. And I'll be very honest, it was very humbling to do that. Um, I was given I will say an experience to chat to so many really nice people in Fife who just needed a wee help in hand. They just needed a wee bit of support. And I've got to stress, we couldn't have done it without working with partners like the council, Castle Furniture, food banks. It was all about working together. And I think for the first time ever, you know, I have a long experience working in communities where I've seen people just dropping the barriers and saying, we need to work together. We need to make this work. Mm -hmm. And to me, you know, I think we had about, oh, maybe up to now, we've had well over 3,600 requests for help through Helping Hands. So when you have that and you try and compare it to your own life, I mean, I don't mm -hmm. have family, my wife's a teacher, but it was very humbling to think, you know, there's people out there and they need help and we're in a position to do our best to help them. Um, so I, I found it that you suddenly said, I haven't got a problem. There's other mm -hmm. people out there who are struggling more who need more support. So it's very humbling to get that opportunity to do that. So that's how I yeah. was understanding that if I could play a role, if we could play a role in helping people in this difficult situation, then I've got to be honest, I got a buzz from that. I slept well at night thinking we're, we're making a difference here. So that's um, what COVID and the pandemic meant to me. That's a really good story. That's, I hope you're recording that story. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm speaking from the heart. I'm telling you, I'm answering your question. But if I was asked that question three days from now, I would be saying the same thing. That's so, brilliant. So, no, well, I mean, uh, I hope it's on Sense Maker. It, I think, uh, from uh, I think Lisa might, might chip in on that. It's, it's a bit, um, 
uh, it's a common theme that we, we've had with uh, a lot of groups that uh, they were used to work in a certain way. If you just did that stuff, and, and basically it was like, right, okay, yes, out. Let's get rid of that. I just just muck in and yes. I just do. So that that's actually one. I think that's a it's not positive. It's something that's heartening, I guess. But mm -hmm. from but it's been even, good. It's been good to see like groups getting recognized for the work they've been doing especially over this last year you know and it's mm -hmm. you know people have been getting out worked out more you know that these services that they are trying to provide is there absolutely and, you know and you know me personally i feel there's so much passion at the moment mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To, to help to help like the local residents of Fife and everything. Yes, absolutely. I agree. I think um, it's brought out the best in people. I think, mm -hmm. you know, I could count on one hand how many stories I picked up that were negative. I think the reaction to most people was, if it needs done, we'll do it. What do mm -hmm. we need to do to make this happen? I think it was as simple as that. And that's very encouraging, very enlightening, very refreshing um, when you're trying to get things done. It's as simple as that for me, you know. One thing I wanted to, to ask if you've, you've noticed that it seemed to have re refocused people a bit more on their immediate local community. I live here. This is this is my neighbor. They they've, they've not accessed food for ages. I need to help them out. And there has been from I was just listening back to all the podcasts and think about that. There seemed to, there's been a shift from. I'm going to drive to, I don't know, Glen Crawford or I need to drive to Dundee and, and, mm -hmm. and, and catch a bed. No, actually, there's coming back to immediately, uh, I need to help a uh, relative down the road here. I need to help my neighbor here. So there's been a, a, a kind of return. Uh, so uh, that, that's actually, um, I don't know, it, it's odd. It, it, it has changed. A lot of relationships. <laughs> so I don't know if it's something you, you've noticed as well. Is it just me just picking that up from who is uh, picked up on the podcast? Uh, uh, to be very honest, I think um, I think you're quite accurate in your analysis there. My feeling is I've worked in, in the community settings for well over thirty years now, and um, I think over that time I've noticed a lot of changes in communities where go back 50, 80 years ago, communities were very much on your doorstep. They were who lived next door to you, the neighbours. And that changed over the decades to the point that I think people then suddenly get caught up in their home life, their work. They come home, they close the door at night. They don't really know what goes on in front of them, uh, right outside their doorstep at times. And there seems to be an apathy as well of somebody else can solve this problem for me. Mm. So I don't have to bother about it. So if the road's got a big pothole in it, that's somebody else's problem. 50 years ago, somebody would have been on the phone about that and somebody's going to get injured with that. So I think there's been a change in how communities perceive that. But the other side of that coin, and I agree with you, is that what COVID brought out was suddenly this sense of community, not just five, but local communities. Um, I've seen lots of evidence, I spoke to lots of groups who basically set themselves up because they want to help their community on their doorstep. They want to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. They want to make sure there's no pensioner going hungry. They wanted to make sure that nobody, if they needed help, there wasn't a, somebody at the end of a phone who could help. And honestly, it was so refreshing and so, I guess, it restored, it restored my faith in community work in the sense of saying that people can come together in Fife when they're given a challenge. It didn't matter how silly it was. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll give you an example. I had a story, and I'm not going to say where whatsoever, um, with somebody who needed help. The dog was very ill, and they needed a prescription picked up, but they couldn't because they were self-isolated. They were in tears on the phone. And more or less, I had a chat, and then I spoke to one of the local groups in the area who was doing volunteers to help the local community. Within half an hour, that person, had sent, that organisation had sent a volunteer to the person's door, picked up the prescription, went to the vets, picked a, brought the prescription back, and that made so much difference to that girl. She was in tears. She thought oh, of that dog could die overnight. She mm -hmm. couldn't get to the vet. And that's the difference to me it's made is it's restored faith in humans helping each other. Mm -hmm. Not being selfish, but being caring and sensitive and willing to go the extra mile to help their community members. Yeah, because there's 
Was it locked down? It's all too easy to close the door, close the curtains, put on Netflix or something. Absolutely. <laughs> it's just like shutters are, are going. Yeah. So, yeah. Put the blankets on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, people have been binging TV series on things and that was their life, you know? And the other story, I suppose, was when people were phoned up saying, what have you been doing? Well, um, I've been locked down. So, I've been doing a wee bit of work online and then I go to bed. Everybody's story was the same, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so looking at the light at the end of the tunnel, we're all hoping that's going to change very shortly. Yeah. So, in in your perspective, is there have you seen any group that's really had it difficult? Let's say the past few months or even the year, if you think about it, is it is it, is there patterns that you've picked up and be like, right, okay, we still haven't got that right. We still need. To well, that, that, that's a very good question, and I will be honest, um, officers and staff and agencies very often fall back on statistics and information and make analysis of these figures to come to conclusions. Mm -hmm. so the very first thing I would say is um, that what was interesting was support to communities. At first, when we looked at helping hands, I naturally thought more requests will come in from areas of deprivation, of need of people who maybe higher unemployment figures or children not attaining well at school. It didn't. It actually was very interesting. Um, I would say there was greater responses from the larger communities where there's more people. So the, mm -hmm. the, Corrie, the big towns, you know, you might get more requests for help. But actually what COVID did was, as I say so many times in the press, COVID didn't choose about your background or it didn't choose about, you know, um, whether it was going to attack you or not, mm -hmm. for everybody, let's be honest. So mm -hmm. what you suddenly found was, if you can't access shopping because you got to lockdown, it doesn't matter whether you've got a job or not. It doesn't matter if you have a nice fancy car and driveway. The reality is you were faced with the same prospect. So I would say, I would say that it treated very, everybody had the same challenges and issues with COVID. You could perhaps argue the areas of greater need may have had a higher percentage of people needing help. So sometimes you could get a crisis where somebody Friday afternoon of no food for the weekend and I've got two kids in the house. These were mm -hmm. really, so again, I put it into perspective. Is it a problem maybe just thinking, oh, I've got to get a bus to work? Or is it a problem saying, I don't know how I'm going to feed my kids this weekend? Mm -hmm. So to me, yes, there would have been a perspective, I suppose, on reflection on that. Um, but that was spread throughout Fife, I would say. You know, the, the, we had equal requests for help through help and hands from different areas for the same range of issues that, that people were doing. Um, and as I said, there was a wide range of things people could come to us for support. And we couldn't have done our job if we didn't have the partners to help us to provide the end service display. You know, sorry, the, the end service sort of delivery as such, you know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I might have sorted somebody out for, for example, let's say I sorted somebody out for a food parcel. They needed it that night. It was our colleagues in Fife Council or the food bank that would go out and knock on the door and say, there's your food parcel. Um, mm -hmm. And the feedback, I mean, I'll, I will use the word because it stuck in my mind so many times that people would say on the phone was when we said, right, look, this is what we think we can do here. They would mm -hmm. say, that's amazing. Because somebody's phoning up and saying, I need food at two o'clock in the afternoon. Somebody was knocking on their door by six o'clock at night saying, there you go. Mm -hmm. You know, honestly, it was a hidden bit that probably not a lot of people see was just how that cohesion works so closely together between mm -hmm. somebody getting help and somebody going and delivering it. So we couldn't have done it without a range of partners saying, we're up for this, let's make this work. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Hopefully that's answered your question there. It was quite long. Oh, yeah, no, 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 <laughs> it's absolutely. We're chatting, this is what it's about. <laughs> yeah, it's, great. It's, it's It's understanding a bit more Sure. what's going on and what has been going on. I mean, a lot of people are still catching up with all that has been going on because yes. obviously we don't have, we not have the time to talk about it as much as we normally would in many yes. ways. So, sure. yeah, uh, but yeah, but so I always like uh, good examples. You, you don't have to name names or so, but, but, but is, there, is there good examples that you, you, you can think, okay, this is like, um, this is uh, something that would not have happened before, but with COVID, we've worked in a different way. We've linked up in different ways, or uh, we worked in partnership in different ways, or we've reached out to a specific community that actually, no, we never did before. 
So we, we do like talking about that because for us that's mm-hmm. for us, that's where we, we talk a bit about more inclusion, more about uh, like widening community rather than right. uh, yeah. sticking to our guns in many ways. Yeah. I'll, I'll try and tell you a story that I think might have not happened had it not been for COVID. Um, you might be aware that a voluntary action did a, crowd, a crowdfunding exercise. Mm-hmm. And the idea was that we asked people to donate in case we were faced with a situation of desperate need of support because of COVID. So it wasn't just for if somebody needed help with benefits or anything like that. There's systems in place to help with that. So our COVID fund was uniquely set up to help people as a last resort to give them support if they were in a situation. So we had a, a lady, I'm not going to tell you where, but we had a lady who had cancer and in the morning, she contacted me at 11.30 in the morning in tears and said, I've just been sent an appointment from the hospital. I need to be there by one o'clock. I don't have the money to get there. What do I do? So the, the systems that are normally in place, you know, patient transport and so mm. forth, these just weren't an option. So as I said, you're faced with a situation of a lady who desperately needs to get to the hospital who is in tears um, and saying, I need to get there for one o'clock. So this poor lady is dealing with enough issues, having cancer, without mm-hmm. having to think of the practicality. So bear in mind, COVID meant you couldn't just jump on a bus. You couldn't easily just jump into a taxi. We couldn't sort out volunteers to drive someone there, which was an option weeks before that. Mm-hmm. So it's a real challenge. So um, my COVID sort of, the crowdfunding was still ongoing at the time. So we, I said to the lady, I said, look, give me 10, 15 minutes and I'll get back to you. She said, oh, that's great. I phoned one of my close colleagues in Fife Council and I explained the situation and I said, I've got a lady in your area who desperately needs to be able to get a taxi to the hospital. She doesn't have the money to do it. I'm not there to judge if she does or doesn't. As far as I'm concerned, she's come to us and she is really desperately needing this help. Can you sort something out from your end? In other words, can you pay the taxi just now and we'll sort it out through our crowdfunding money later on? Within 10 minutes, the person got back to me and said, that's sorted. Um, just send the invoice to us from the taxi. We'll pay it and we'll sort it out later. I phoned the lady back five minutes later and she was in the taxi going to hospital. Mm. 10 to 1. So that's how quickly it responded. So that's a good example how mm-hmm. we... Wouldn't, we might have had to say the ifs and the whats and the buts and the whys. We didn't. We just said, what needs to be done to make this happen? And let's worry mm-hmm. about it afterwards. The priority is this lady getting to hospital. She definitely needs this support from us all. Let's do what needs to be done. So that was one story that sticks in my mind. It's a good one. Definitely. Uh, you think it's a shame it doesn't happen more often. Or, but yeah. <laughs> you're, you're absolutely right, but it has that pressure did it made it happen. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And uh, but our priority was let's take that stress and worry away from this individual. She's enough of a battle to fight as it is without us piling on the pressure. So, you know, you do your best. I think that's what I was trying to say. Is, is um, remember on helping hands, I've got six other colleagues, and we were all helping different areas of Fife, and the stories were the same all over. People going that extra mile or saying, if I can't solve that, I'll talk to somebody else who can solve that. So we had all kinds of organisations in the background either talking to us for help or we would go to to help. I mean, for example, I'll give you another example of that. Um, we had a girl who the referral was made via Gingerbread who desperately needed a pram because um, she was going out with her child. So when, when COVID was allowing you to go out for exercise, she was obviously stressed out with her child in the house who was running about and realised, I need to get him out, but didn't have a pram to actually do this. Um, so through the council, we made contact with the local home start team. Within half an hour, they'd sourced a pram. We'd made arrangements for that, that girl to go up to a local community centre, pick up the pram. Problem was solved within three hours. Mm. So uh, I think people just had to think out the box the one in the the floor, yeah. they didn't mm-hmm. do this in their job every day. They had to adapt, they had to learn, they had to communicate with others, they had to work in partnership. That was the key things I think that made Helping Hands a success. Can you tell us about any other projects that you've been working on, you know, and how they've been helping as well? 
Um, can I just kind of clarify that, Lisa? Do you mean um, yes. voluntary action or do you mean... Um, like, in general, general, but I'm mostly looking at um, projects that voluntary action has started other than, you know, helping hands. Right, I okay. Guess, so I'm guessing like things like supporting small voluntary groups uh -huh. during that time and... I guess it's, it's a wider, wider picture of, of FEA. Right. At the end, was definitely something that you, that was in reaction to COVID. Right. But, uh, but I'm guessing, yeah. I mean, if you've seen any impact on voluntary groups, small organisations who might not be as solid as the big charities that have right. uh, funding or maybe more grassroots or semi-independent voluntary groups, because as you say, some of them formed uh, during COVID. Uh, okay, um, uh, I'll give you just three examples then, um, and I, I apologise because I'll jump about a little bit here because there's different stories I'll tell you. Five, five voluntary actions, so it's got three core parts to it. We, we help people with employability, we help people into volunteering, and we help with community, community capacity building, which is a job I do. Um, so when we were doing helping hands, by no means did these areas go to sleep. We still had to try and maintain work and support for people. That meant a challenge for Five Voluntary Action to work differently. We had to think differently about how we engage with people, with clients, with community. So, for example, um, at the very start of Helping Hand, there was a slightly different project, and where basically we we invited people to offer themselves to volunteer. Now, I think I can get the exact number, but I think there was something like one thousand over one thousand eight hundred people put their name forward to volunteer. So right away, we our volunteer team was was given the task of matching up volunteers with communities that needed help, with organisations that needed help. So we'd never have had to do that to that extent before, mm -hmm. but the, the pandemic had brought that need forward. So we did that, we kept in regular contact with, um, with volunteers. We didn't have to use all the volunteers because sometimes all the community groups out there don't need volunteers as much as what was offered. So. That was something that we had to do as a, as a result of the pandemic and a service that, that was delivered. Another key thing we do very much so is about funding. Um, we help groups to access funding. Um, and during the pandemic, suddenly funding was drying up in a lot of sources. The funding that was available um, through Scottish Government and other funders was very much about helping groups cope with COVID and the pandemic and what they were doing. So Five Voluntary Action, we, we acted very much as facilitators to help groups out there in the community who were doing something for COVID, we helped them access funding to help them do that job. So for example, I, I mm -hmm. maybe helped, you know, apart from food banks and that who, you know, who obviously were getting as much support as could could be with funding, um, there might have been a project where a little community group just wanted to, through the local school, give food parcels or give, you know, um, lunches for the kids or whatever. So we, for example, we were able to access our Scottish Government monies to give them a £2,000 grant towards that. So we were able to sort of be the pivotal bit that linked into that. Another interesting thing that came up through COVID was, you can imagine, I was telling you about being on Helping Hands, very often people talking to us, they were just grateful to talk to someone. Some mm -hmm. people just spoke, they hadn't spoke to anybody in a week. So what that kind of raised the issue of is we recognise in Five Voluntary Action is that befriending is very important. An awful lot of community groups out there wanted to do their best with befriending. They recognised that actually picking up the phone and having a friendly chat with somebody was something that our community is very much needed. Mm -hmm. So what Five Voluntary Action did was we then launched a sort of like a befriending service. Um, in other words, we were willing to, to identify, recruit, train volunteers who wanted to do befriending. Because as much as befriending can sound very glamorous and nice and rewarding, challenges as well mm -hmm. you know if you're on the phone doing a befriending call and somebody says i've got a number of problems and you don't know how to deal with that it could be a little bit daunting or scary or quite stressful mm -hmm. so what we did was we set up the service to actually recruit volunteers to do befriending and that's went from strength to strength so we, I, I don't i can't give you the exact number but we have a number of people um who are now on our books who do befriending and get support through five voluntary action to do that so better than a wee community group setting up a befriend and thinking they just pick up the phone and talk to somebody, we said, brilliant idea. Well, let us support you to do that. So mm -hmm. that's what we did. I think another thing, you're asking about what things and what things have changed, I suppose. 
For a minute, I'll just talk about my job of doing capacity building. So in other words, as a capacity building officer, my job is about supporting community groups with a wide range of issues that helps them with things like their governance, setting up, funding. We get groups approach us that want to become charities or companies or groups that need to fill in applications or do newsletters. Or There's a host of things that community groups will approach Five Voluntary Action for support with. Well, because of COVID, we had to change our way of working. Mm -hmm. but thankfully, I personally think we were very quick off the mark at recognising that and starting to adapt our services. So what I have found personally is that we still have groups out there who need help, who need support, mm -hmm. who need advice and guidance. And what it meant was an awful, an awful lot of our services became online. So for example, I would, I, <laughs> as the years went by, it's just increased more and more, I attend team meetings, Zoom meetings with community groups. So if a group like um, wants to meet at seven o'clock at night and I can actually sign in, it might save me an hour traveling to them and an hour back and an hour at the meeting. I could do it in an hour. You know, I could share documents with groups and show them how to guide them how to write um, applications up or, or um, constitutions or things like that. So that's been, I'd say, a little bit positive thing. That being said, it doesn't beat meeting groups face to face. That's what our job's all about, is engaging with people directly. And I'm looking forward to that sort of coming back in. Um, but that's probably what I'm saying is, is we have not changed what we do, but because of the pandemic, we've maybe had to change our advice on how we support things. Mm. For example, we have lots of groups coming to us, charities coming to us, who were saying, um, we need to hold our annual general meeting, but we don't know if we're allowed to do it online. So we had to help groups to actually change their constitutions or give them advice as to what they needed to do to make sure their meetings, their AGMs were legal and binding. So mm -hmm. we had a lot of inquiries like that. So every day, people phone us about different things that the capacity building officers, we try our best to help with. And um, it's still as rewarding as ever when you feel you're making a difference in helping your group progress. It's been a really odd year for charities and the volunteer sector in general anyway. Absolutely. If you think about it, it's a very good point, if you think about the number of groups, whether it be a bowling club or, you know, or, or a youth club or whatever, they haven't had the ability to bring in income. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, they can't go out and just do fundraising, you know, shake a can or do a, a car boot sale or do a let's do help with shopping at the local Sainsbury's. They can't do that. So, so it's been a very, very tough year for a lot of organisations. Think of organisations who pay staff, for example. You know, how do, how do they raise the money to pay the wages? So this has probably been the most trying year for charities and community groups to survive, to be honest. So we try our best to help to support, to point groups in the direction of where they might possibly be able to get funding to sustain them and keep them afloat during this very hard period. So how would groups get in touch with you? Is it literally just online, give you a buzz or what, what's what's yes. what, what, Absolutely. So there's, there's no pop in the office. So, so what, sure. what, what could they do? <laughs> um, basically, you know, on all, uh, I mean, as I mentioned earlier about the website, um, mm -hmm. um, but obviously the website, fea.org, www.fea.org.uk, it's, um, that takes you to our home page and from that home page you can access a huge amount of support not just for capacity building but it tells everybody about our events it tells everybody about training opportunities that are going to be online it gives people all the contact numbers to contact the officer if they need help with a particular thing also we would encourage people to either email or phone my email personally is just dave at fea.org our telephone number is 0845 Six zero zero six zero four six. So we are happy to take phone calls. Um, I'll make sure to uh, add I, it as well. I'm sorry, say that again. I'll make, make sure to add it as well on the post Please. so people can okay. click on it. If people phone our general number, they'll be they'll get a menu. If you need help with, please press one, two, three, four, five. So the phone actually points people in the right direction of the support they require. But what I would say is either by phone, email, access the website, there's contact details on the website as well if you need to talk to anybody in particular. Sounds good, thank you. I'll make sure to add that. Thank you. Can I just say, um, 
if I hadn't went on the F, the Thrive Voluntary Action website in 2019, I wouldn't be sitting here today. Exactly. Kind of thing. Because <laughs> I had just been getting to the end of college and I didn't know what to do. And folks said, try volunteering. And the only website I knew was your your website. And then I got involved with Elric and the rest of the team doing the different past project. And now, you know, I sort of got employed last June with them. So, and I had 16 years by the time I joined them. So, I would just like to say thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I would just like to say thank you for that. <laughs> Lovely to hear that story, Lisa, to be honest with you. And yes, there is a huge amount of stories out there of people who have accessed my contract who particularly wanted to volunteer. And volunteer has changed their lives, whether it was about you know, employment, whether it was about further education, whether it was about having the confidence to take part in community life or community groups. We have seen a lot of people on these journeys and that's what gives me the buzz doing the job I do, is thinking that we make a difference in people's lives. That's the only reward we want, really. Mm -hmm. I was going to ask about that. Is it still possible to volunteer for Helping Hands or similar? Um, um, yes, as far as I'm aware, you can go on the site and register, but the easiest way would be to just phone up or send an email saying I'm interested in chatting to somebody about volunteering and okay. one of our volunteer team would talk to them directly. So they will have more expertise on that than I would, for example. You okay. know? But um, again, just a glimpse at the Five Voluntary Action site, if you look at our, our, our events and so forth, there's a host of events that people can participate in online, all free, that really helps them in different stages. So everything from volunteering to training, we provide lots of different opportunities there. And nine times out of 10, it's all free. The only time we charge as an organisation is if we've had to pay a lot of money to bring in a third party to deliver that. It's the only way we can get our money back. But the, the, the things that we actually facilitate ourselves, we don't charge for. Right, well, that's us coming to the end of our chat today. Next so, coffee. <laughs> <laughs> coffee's over. Have you finished your coffee? <laughs> Things are going well. <laughs> but it's it's uh, been really good to have, have you on board, David. Yeah, really so interesting. Thank you very much. Was it okay? I'm taking this not getting recorded now, so I can ask questions. <laughs> so it's been great to talk to you today. Thank you, David, for coming along.